Hi, Nancy from Metal here. I recently met with Dan Geis. Although he's originally from Banff, Alberta, he's located now here in Montreal, so I was able to drop by his studio for a chat. Dan is an animator, an illustrator, a musician, a coder. Dan is many things, but above all, Dan is a great storyteller. You may already be familiar with some of his work. He's won numerous awards. So let's take a look at part one of my interview with Dan Guys. Hi Dan, how's it going? Good, thank you for having me. Uh, before we start our interview, we're going to take a look at some of your work, okay? okay cool. So here's a clip that we put together. I am a computer. I am a tell you first of all that I love your work. Oh, thank, you. thank you. So you had a bit of an unusual childhood. The influences I think uh, helped shape the work that you're doing today. Could you tell us a bit about that? Yeah sure sure. Um, it wasn't like it wasn't a storybook unusual childhood. I wish it was more of a fairy tale weird but my my mother's an artist and my dad is an inventor. So he uh, those there with their two powers combined I was really strongly influenced as a kid. So my mom at a very very early age, I would ask my mom to draw me bats because I really really liked bats for some reason, and she would draw me little bats with little pot bellies and tuxedos for me, and I loved these bats, and I would try to draw them and copy them, and mom was actually really encouraging and supportive, but she she was also she wasn't just telling me how awesome what I did was it, it it wasn't always just like put his drawing on the fridge it's so amazing she would actually offer me constructive criticism at a very early age which was great because I, I advanced more quickly like I learned how to observe and I mm -hmm. noticed my mistakes earlier and instead of thinking I was just awesome all the time so that was great so I really started learning about color staying in the lines I was really bad at staying in the lines I could draw better than some kids but I was awful at staying in the lines with coloring I just didn't care about coloring that much but then my mom was like like Dan you don't have color flying off your face like you know try to keep it in the lines a little bit and so then I realized that color did stay in lines and was part of lines so yeah anyways and then with my dad he was an inventor with this crazy shop of computers in the basement 
at a time when nobody really had computers, like mm -hmm. there, there just wasn't that many of them. So I was introduced at a very early age to programming um, because I would try to make drawings in the computer. And at the time I used a color computer, uh, they called it a color computer, and you would type code to make a picture. And I thought, yeah. I'd look on the cover of the magazines that would show you how to do it, because there was a rainbow computer, maybe they had a rainbow magazine. Okay. And there would be programming inside and it would tell you how you can make these amazing pictures. And I'd get all excited, like, I'm gonna make this picture, I'm gonna make that picture, and then I'm gonna do this. And then I would see the code it took to make it. And I would do the code, I'd do the code, and not only did you have to copy it, you had to check it. Like, there was always errors. Like and I was not used to this idea of making a picture and having errors hmm. before I could even see it. Anyways, so that's how I started with computers. But then later on, my dad built a supercomputer in the basement that he had constructed out of all these other computer parts and he built computers for a living. So that all went into it and it was like this giant computer with a huge lever that you would turn on and the house would go dark and then it would all come back, the thing would power on. And then I could use this program called Autodesk Animator which was a little DOS based pixel and anim pixel animation program was the resolution was 320 by 240 mm -hmm. and I would use a mouse to draw the little characters and move forward through it and yeah that's where I got my start with those two and they were both really supportive and my dad always would help me he would just encourage he would get software if there was the huh. new animation software he he worked at a place where he could get it to try out and so I was being introduced to 3D Studio Max way early on, went before it was really what it was, and this thing called Pavre, which was like an open source 3D program. And at that point, again, it went back to having to program everything. So there was a real disconnect between drawing what I like to do, which was draw and art, and working in the computer. But they worked well together in a weird, disjointed way. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, We're it does. a little bit. But... <laughs> no, it's okay. <laughs> well, since then, I think you've figured out an easier way to use computers with your art. Yeah, technology's come a long way yeah. since then. So we're going to take an, a look at another piece that you've put together. Okay. That won uh, a Webby Award, actually. And it's called, Do You Know What Nano Means? Let's have a look at it. Hey, do you know what nano means? It means small, very small. It is a million times smaller than the smallest measure on a ruler. If you want to get an idea of how small a nanometer really is, you'll need to take a piece of hair from your head. Go on, it won't hurt. Got it. Now take a good close look at that strand of hair. Not much to look at, is it? If we were to shrink you down, smaller than the smallest thing you can see with the naked eye, you will find that your piece of hair starts to look a lot more interesting. You are now about the size of a red blood cell. Your strand of hair is a massive tree compared to you. Even at this size, you're still about a thousand times too big to be considered nano. To get you down to the nanoscale, we will have to shrink you to about 100 nanometers tall. Hey, where are all the lights? You are now smaller than the wavelength of visible light. You are practically invisible. But for the sake of demonstration, I think we should turn on some lights. This size, the red blood cell is 1,000 times bigger than you are. It is like an enormous stadium. Welcome to the nanoscale. You could probably hold a common cold virus in your hands quite comfortably now. The rhinovirus is only about 30 nanometers across and is nearly impossible to see next to the red blood cell. A red blood cell is too big to be considered nano. However, it's made up of all kinds of nanomaterials. If you were to look close enough, you would see that the outer walls of the cell are stabilized by a flexible, mesh-like protein skeleton. 
The bars and connectors that make up this mesh are considered part of a nanomaterial. Without these reinforcing nanostructures, the cell would be much more fragile and not nearly as flexible. It wouldn't stand a chance in your body. Everything is made up of nanomaterials. Nanomaterials are an arrangement of molecules and atoms that, when combined, create stable building blocks that can be made into larger, more complex materials and structures. Which is pretty much everything, including this little piece of hair. I bet you didn't think there was so much going on in such a small amount of space. So that piece was done for Science Alberta Foundation. Dan, can you tell us what your involvement was, how that piece was put together? Sure. So initially I worked for the Science Alberta Foundation on what they were trying to do is they were trying to make an MMORPG for kids about science where you could go into this world and wander around and meet people and experiment mm -hmm. and, and learn things about science uh, and solve problems with the community. Um, so during that period while they were developing it, I did a whole bunch of character artwork for them and environment artwork mm -hmm. using illustration. We talked about trying to make films, little tiny films, instead of games. Mm -hmm. um, at least not focusing so much energy on them because games take a lot of work, a lot, sure. a lot of work. And a video is a little bit more contained, it's a lot more manageable, and they're a lot cheaper. Mm -hmm. So we tried to encourage them to do videos, which we were all a little bit nervous about how it would go. So Nano was actually the first video that they'd ever done, and they really went out on a limb with me, mm. um, because they had never really done those kinds of animations or videos before. So what was really great about it, though, is I had a tremendous amount of creative freedom. Uh, okay. They had already liked the characters and the stuff I had done with them previously, so they were really comfortable with my art style, so we didn't have to readdress that too much. And they were pretty hands-off with the whole pro process, so they gave me the learning objectives, which were fairly basic because the audience is young. And the main goal of the piece is to teach basic concepts, but don't place down to children and don't play to adults specifically. Okay. So it has to be something that could... Uh, be entertaining for adults and children, even if they didn't learn anything, but also provide an unconscious learning. And Nano did that. Nano was the proof to them that you could do that. So our role in that, in Nano, I work with Emily Page. She helps me produce. She's the production manager on my end of things. And our role was, we've got a learning objective package. We've got the basic research that they had around what Nano was and the questions they want to answer. Okay. So then what we do is I do my own research. So since my father is an engineer, scientist, inventor, I do have quite a significant interest in the sciences. So I do the reading anyway, but I research the material and then I try to find the best way to take what I learned and communicate that to somebody who might not know anything about it at all. Okay. Which is, that's kind of the goal of all these videos is to take complex ideas and at least introduce them in a simplistic way so you learn to ask questions. Nano, little girl character, it used to be she was a little character sick in bed. Oh. And there was a puppet show that was like a paper puppet show while she was sick in bed teaching her all about the nano scale. The script just didn't keep working. We kept having to fight too much to make it work. Mm -hmm. So then overnight it became what it is today. Almost a total, it was like a rewrite overnight and we just put it, and it just worked out. Huh. So we rewrote, designed the characters, and then after we do that, um, after I've built all the characters and drawn all the pieces, I put them together, and I show them what the character will move like. Okay. Um, because at that time, they were nervous. They didn't know how it would work, and they were happy with that. And then after that, they kind of leave me alone. Oh, and then I just Yeah, I just go nuts, and I just put the film together and I just have to stay under a certain time limit. And then after that I do the music and we do the sound all here. Um, just record it, do the Foley here, uh, just in use the closet, fill the closet up with a whole bunch of blankets and stuff so that it's not all echoey and record all the little sounds of skin and, and hair and clothes and hmm. shoes and do all that stuff. So kind of everything, we get to do everything. Huh. It's really fun. Yeah, it sounds like it. Yeah. So there you have it, part one of my interview with Dan Guys. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you soon.